This is AUGforums.com Real Talk, an unfiltered and independent perspective on Acumatica Cloud ERP. First, thank you to our sponsors, Repay, DataSelf, and Velixo. Please take a minute to support this podcast by clicking each one of the sponsor banners located at AUGforums.com slash sponsors. Our sponsors track clicks, and every click helps to support this podcast. My name is Tim Rodman, and I want to mention two more things in this pre-recorded intro before we get started. First, I'm always looking for victims, ahem, I mean guests, on the podcast. If you use Acumatica in any capacity, no matter how small, I'd love to talk with you check out AUG, augforums.com slash podcast and click the link near the top of the page to learn about being a guest on the podcast. Second, I'd love to see you listed on my Rolodex. Check out the instructions at augforums.com slash Rolodex to see how you can add yourself to the list. All right, that's it for the pre-recorded intro. Let's get started. Today is Wednesday, October 20th, 2001, and this is episode number 53, Implementing Acumatica Construction, Payroll, and Manufacturing with Laura at Company X. Laura, we'll keep it Laura with no last name and no company so we can get into the dirt here. Well, not dirt, but you know, the details, Yeah. the gory details yeah. of doing Go ahead and introduce yourself and your background. Yeah, so um, I'm Laura with Company X, and uh, I've been with my company for um, 18 years. Um, I started here right out of college, and I'm a little bit of a homegrown um, employee, if you would. Um, Our company has been around for, oh, 30 plus years, and uh, we are a manufacturing and a construction company. Um, as well as we have full in-house design services, uh, marketing, um, and things like that. Um, we began searching for hey, an ERP Can I just system. say, 18 yeah. years, you sound like you are in a great position to know what's going on and be involved on an ERP implementation. Well, I hope I do. Um, I think my 18 years here has led me to a lot of um, knowledge on um, our process? Well, I hope I do. Um, I think my 18 years here has led me to a lot of um, knowledge on um, our processes, which is where I, I find a lot of my skill um, as far as um, outside knowledge of working from another company and bringing that in um, as, a, as a resource of exposure to another way other companies do things that I don't have. And I think sometimes I feel like that is a hindrance, but I know that it doesn't have to be a hindrance. It's only a hindrance if I allow it. And hearing that your construction and manufacturing to me is very, very interesting. I think Acumatica is in a unique position to be able to deliver both, but you know, we'll get into those details. So just highlighting those two things. Go ahead. Yeah. Keep going. Well, yeah, and that's, I mean, what you just said is part of the, I think the biggest part why we chose Acumatica, um, needed a system that could bring our, you know, kind of clunky old system, our our broken systems, um, and bring it into one holistic place. Um, We were using, you know, an online system for, um, our marketing and our sales, we were using um, probably 15 to 20 databases to manage our projects and manage our quality control, as well as our manufacturing, our scheduling was another software, our finances were another software. So we had a lot of different parts and they were all broken up and separate. And we just needed one place to bring it all together. And I do believe we have found that in Acumatica. So I know you showed me before we hit record, you've got a long page of detailed notes. So I'm going to set the expectation <laughs> here. We both have a hard stop probably in about 40 minutes or so. 
I'll set the and we'll get as yeah. far into I love details. I love tangents. So we're going to dive into that as much as we can. But just dear listener, expect a part two on this conversation. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think we've got a lot of good things. We've had a lot of um, valleys and we've had a lot of mountain experiences with Acumatica. Um, it's been it's been a roller coaster some months, um, but I think all in all, we are coming to a good plateau on a mountain is where we're getting to. And can you give us some quick dates like when you went live and even your involvement with the project, you know, as it changed over time before we dive into the details? Yeah. So I'm not exactly sure how many years ago it was we started our search. I want to say we're probably close to two and a half to three years that we started searching uh, for an ERP system. I got involved in probably uh, for an ERP system. I got involved in probably early October of 2019. Um, we phased, did a phased in approach uh, for, um, because we have so many different parts. We started with our um, marketing and our um, sales side of things. So that started, we went live with the CRM uh, December of 2019. And then um, we went live with the construction and finance portion uh, not including payroll. I'll make sure that that's clear. So it's construction, finance, projects, uh, all of that went live in July of 2020. And then uh, we went live with our payroll, uh, Acumatica payroll in April of this past year in 2021. And our goal is to be live with manufacturing January of 2022. So we've got about. You do, you're, and I'm glad you bit it off in chunks. Uh, at least you're live on something at this point, Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, it sounds like it, I, I like your description too, valleys and mountains. So, uh, you know, where do you want to start on a valley or a mountain? <laughs> um, well, let's start with the mountain. Um, you know, going back as far as the CRM, when we implemented CRM, we kind of rushed it, um, a little faster than I think we were anticipating originally simply because we had an expiring um, registration with our online program we were using at that time for, for our marketing and our pre-bid sales. Um, so we kind of looked at it as, look, hey, this is an opportunity to not have to pay another year subscription. Let's get it done. Um, so I got, kind of got pulled into that in, in this last minute. I had like one week to get a lot of stuff done and, uh, and we made it and, and, uh, and we made it. And um, I think they were a good group um, to start with because they were small. And I think we were able to build upon what they learned and um, I, like what they learned that was good and that was bad. So then as we then progressed in, in working out the finance stuff, uh, we did push back our go live with that one time because of COVID. I mean, COVID came in like a beast and we found ourselves with manufacturing being able to continue, um, construction being able to continue because our business was deemed essential, which is great for us. Um, however, everyone in our office went home. And so we completed um, our go live um, basically from the desks in our bedrooms, in our basements, in our living rooms, kitchen tables. Um, so that definitely presented its own set of challenges. But I think, I think overall we felt like we were doing well going into go live. Um, a couple months in, I think we realized that there were some problem areas maybe problems, struggles that we didn't anticipate. And so we started started trying to resolve them um, and, and figure out the root cause. Some of them were our own processes. Uh, our old system would have handled something one way. Acumatica handled it completely different. And what we were finding was it was creating some um, inaccurate data. And when you have inaccurate data, it's just not good. Not good at all. Um, one of the things that we found, oh, go ahead. You said, uh, back on the CRM piece that you got pulled in and I'm curious, mm -hmm. um, did you continue to get pulled in on inaccurate data as well? And if so, 
or did you just get pulled in again and keep getting pulled in again? Um, so initially it was my manager at that time I was working in our project management department and he would be like, Hey, can you do this? And I would get pulled in. And, um, because, um, CR or ERP system is not my background. And so it was just, okay, well, you have time, come help. You have time, come help. And it turned into, I learned more and more and more and realized how much I liked it. Um, and it turned into, um, after we went live, it turned into, hey, we need someone full-time to do this. And we need someone part-time to do payroll. So how do you feel about doing both? Um, so that, that caused job transition for me. So it was training somebody else, trying to go live with payroll, still fix the old, you know, the original go live problems it was training somebody else, trying to go live with payroll, still fix the old, you know, the original go live problems. Um, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of juggling that was happening, uh, the last six months of last year. So I think I, I the, love getting hearing pulled that. into things. I, I, I um, love that. But from, yeah. from your personal side, I, you know, you said, okay, now I can't remember exactly how you said, it, but it, you weren't like trained in ERP, but mm -hmm. in my opinion, yeah. I don't think anyone is trained in ERP. You just get, <laughs> you get, you're in the right place at the right time or the wrong place at the wrong time. And I'm glad <laughs> to hear that you like it. Uh, but I, I feel like that's what happens 90% of the time. It, it's sort of accidental and it's not the, the grandiose visionary kind of a role. It's the person who's willing to get in, roll up their sleeves and get stuff done. And you seem to have yeah. that kind of personality. And that's, that's cool to hear that it's turned into a new role for you. Hopefully one that was more enjoyable yeah. for you. Yeah, I think so. Um, my background, um, my schooling background is business and architecture. Um, so that lent well to the construction and the manufacturing industry. And then on top of that, you have, um, you know, with my business background, doing what I was doing in project managing and, and a lot of what I was doing was scheduling outbound freight, on-site deliveries and keeping all those ducks in a row. I think those things that I've done over the years and how I've grown through the company, they've allowed me to just enhance more skills that um, I kind of had, but they've just, those skills have flourished. And I think I find those skills in helping to manage Acumatica and like thinking out of the box, thinking critically. Um, those are all skills that I think are really important to that hated IT person. I like that. And architecture, now you're just doing system architecture, right? Yeah. You're a system architect. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take that. <laughs> So, it's a valley. So you went live and uh, yeah. what were some of those challenges? We went live. So some of our challenges, I think the biggest one that we struggled with for the longest amount of time was that um, one thing Acumatica does allow, um, it doesn't have a setting as of right now to be able to turn it off is um, creating project budget lines on the fly. So we, we are a budget driven company for our projects. And so what that means is we set a budget for $5,000 for labor for this specific task. And we want all the labor to hit against that $5,000 budget. Um, the problem that we have is that in many, and we want all the labor to hit against that $5,000 budget. Um, the problem that we have is that in many areas, you can create new budget line items without even realizing you're creating them, you know, by simply having what I would call a mismatch um, of your task and your cost code. Um, that's not in the budget. Once that mismatch occurs, you got a new budget line and that became incredibly cumbersome, incredibly cumbersome for our project managers to handle because you know, they're trying to keep the project on budget. They're trying to control costs. Um, and this was doing anything but helping them do that. Now, when you say a new row, you just mean like a new record on the budget tab of the project screen, right? Yeah, right. 
So right. it's not actually Aro that probably has a zero budget and now it has an actual dollar amount. Yeah, that's exactly right, Tim. Okay. Um, so that obviously caused its own set of challenges because, you know, we don't, when you, um, when you align your budget at the end of each month, and you see where all your line items are, if you've got a bunch of budget lines that are new with zero budgets and you've got cost to them, there's nothing, you can't reconcile it. it you can't reconcile apples to apples to make sure that you're keeping your job on budget. And remind me on this, so if I remember right on that screen, you've got, if I think of the fields that make a line unique, you've got task, you've got account group, you got cost code. I think you even have inventory ID. And I think though it depends on which setting you're using, which one are using, what's yeah. a unique budget line for you? Yeah, so watching things. Um, if our inventory items um, do not fall into the account group that is on that task and cost code budget line, um, it would make another budget line. So like you really had to know what account groups the items were in to make sure that you were matching it up with the right cost code and task. And when that all started to not be perfectly aligned, budget lines everywhere. And so now you're getting more involved with Acumatica. <laughs> <laughs> uh, how, how do you then, oh, so th there's your challenge. Where are you at now? And um, are you still struggling with that or do you have a, a way of handling that now? Um, so after many discussions with our VAR and even with um, some of the consultants at Acumatica through support, um, what we came up with with um, some of the consultants at Acumatica through support, um, what we came up with was the, our only option was to customize. So we had a very large, I think I would call it, I, I, don't, I don't know in my opinion, it's a large customization made um, so that we could stop the screens from entering budget lines or task cost code, item, account group combinations that didn't exist on the project. It, it does a lot of, um, I mean, you have to understand, I'm, this is not my language, but it does a lot of looking and, and verifying and validating um, against you know, that project number, that task, that cost code, the budget, and, and it validates that everything is matching. If it doesn't match, it stops it and it won't let the user go any further. Purchase orders, sales orders, um, time and expense entry. So time entry, expense entry, AP entry. Um, I think that's all of them. Wow, that, that is I, a lot of places. Yeah. Yeah. It touches a lot of screens and um, our VAR was incredibly helpful in creating that customization for us. Um, I think we have one more area that we're testing, but even so we've, and we phased the, the rollout of the customization. So we started with one area and we got that Smart. one area working properly. And then we added a new area on, and then we got that area working properly and so on and so forth. And they just kind of felt like dominoes then. I like that. So then you actually get an error. <clears throat> I thought it was interesting. You said even purchase orders, that's not like a released transaction, but you read purchase orders. That's not like a released transaction, but you're even stopping it mm -mm. far enough upstream. So it doesn't cause problems downstream. It's like on the save, yeah. I would assume yet that you now get a red X error if you don't have a matching budget line when you save it? Correct. Correct. And we also have it. So when you enter the task and you go over to the cost code, when you use a little magnifying glass, and this is on any of the screens, and you're and you use a magnifying glass to look at what cost codes, that makes sure that it only shows the cost codes, cost code or codes that would match directly with the task that you've selected. Very interesting. I like that. That sounds cool. So that, so that has been mostly saw, I mean, that sounds like a big uh, snowball of it starts off small. And then by the time it landed on your plate, it's probably this big, gigantic snowball that was a real pain to work through. But maybe you stop the bleeding first 
and then work on the cleanup and then work on the cleanup or how did you approach yeah. that? So we kind of had, we were kind of cleaning up as we went. Um, like each month when the project managers would do their um, P&Ls at the end of the month, they would identify, hey, this should, this was a zero budget line, you know, that was created. We had a notification system set up. Um, so it automatically, when a new line was created, it automatically notified myself, the project manager, the department manager, and our finance manager. And then we could go in and do our best to correct it right away. But at the end of the month, if it wasn't corrected, they could correct it in their P&Ls and their monthly forecasting um, and adjusting adjusting their budgets as needed for project completion. Was that a business event so we, notification that was sending it? Uh, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. We had um, one of our support guys told him, Hey, it's working right. You can finally turn off the notification. We've had our customization in for about two months, month and a half to two months. I think it's been pretty fully functional and, uh, and successfully, I, I can't say that I, I've gotten an email in a really long time where it's created something it wasn't supposed to. Um, That's got to be a really good feeling. <laughs> it is. <laughs> it, it really is to feel like we have finally conquered um, that mountain, if you would, because um, it, it definitely felt like a mountain as we were going through it because Every day I was getting anywhere between three and 10 emails a day of new budget lines that were created because someone had fat fingers. You know, they typed uh, an F instead of a G or something like that in the cost code and it would just snowball it away. F instead of a G or something like that in the cost code and it would just snowball it away. I really identify with that because I was in that position at a previous company. I was data cleanup guy at a manufacturing company, and I, I could write the alert to tell you when it happened, but I didn't have the ability in that system to customize the screen to stop it from happening. So it was just like yeah. this perpetual snowball. So that's, that's amazing <laughs> to me that you were actually able to stop the snowball. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it was not... I, I'd say we probably went around testing that cust the initial customization. Um, we probably tested it for a month back and forth until we got it just right. Um, they would do something, we would test it. We would tell them some, give them feedback and they'd fix it. And then we'd test it again. And I think all in all, it was probably about a month of back and forth for the initial. But once we got the first screen working, down on one, get it working, and then kind of like your phased approach, the implementation, that's a great way to approach things. I like that. Yeah. Because then if you if you don't phase things in, and, and I've seen this in other areas in Acumatica and even in like report writing, um, some advice I was given early on with a report writer was make one change. Check that to make sure that it worked. If that worked, then do another change and, you know, so on and so forth. And you, you take baby steps until you really know that the progress you're making is good progress. And then you, then you can go all in for it. So. I like that. So it sounds like your first challenge there was stopping the bleeding on project budget lines and you were able to turn a valley into a mountain. What other valleys yeah. that you got on your list there? <laughs> yeah. See what other values do I have on my list? So um, I think one of the things for us, um, and you might have asked this at one point, was like, what's the best how things work? Regardless of how silly the question might feel, but the one thing we did not know was the process, uh, we didn't understand, the process that Acumatica goes through and when your costs hit your GL accounts, when you have, when you're purchasing materials. So our old system, it hit the GL accounts when the bills were actually processed and paid. Acumatica hits when your materials are received. And we didn't know that. And it, the problem that it caused was we would receive something. Our purchasing manager didn't have the right price on it. And then our AP girl would just fix the price because that's always what we did. But then that fixed price, didn't actually hit the item. It didn't hit the project. Um, it wasn't included as part of the um, cost of goods in, in our inventory. Just 
fix the price because that's always what we did. But then that fixed price didn't actually hit the item. It didn't hit the project. Um, it wasn't included as part of the um, cost of goods in, in our inventory. Um, so we learned pretty quickly that we had to change our way of doing things to make sure that number one, our prices were right when we put them on the purchase order and before that purchase order was received, the materials. Um, you remember the if second this was for we, stock items or non-stock items or both? Both. Oh, okay, interesting. That's both. Um, and the second thing that we had to learn was how to deal with the receipts that were now wrong because it was received at the wrong price. We learned that we had to return them. Then we had to use AP to wipe out the original receipt and return. We had to fix the price back and you got to start all over again. And that was, and still continues to be a challenge for us because we don't always know the right price. Um, so we accept that there's going to be some of that that happens. But that is definitely a question I would have never thought to ask of like, okay, how does Acumatica process this? Because this is what we're coming from. Are we going to have to think about this differently? Um, yeah, that's definitely yeah, the biggest challenge. How would you customize that? I mean, the customization is not going to know what the correct no. price should be. It sounds like even the purchasing person might not know until it comes in on the invoice. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, it's definitely um, something that we've, we've tried our best to address in a uh, workflow situation, um, but it's not perfect. You know, there's going to be mistakes. Um, I spent probably 45 minutes with our AP person. This, um, I spent probably 45 minutes with our AP person this afternoon, trying to sort out some of these bills and debit adjustments and um, things like that, that just kind of get lost in the shuffle because, the system's not perfect and we as people are not perfect. Interesting. Um, so a valley, that is still a valley on that one. It is still a valley, but I think it's, it's not a deep valley. It's a shallow valley. Um, it, it's, it's more of us learning as employees how to do our jobs the best that we can do to eliminate the amount of rework that we end up having to do because that's what it is. It is rework. It's going back to receiving saying, Hey, you got to return this. Hey, now you have to re-receive it again. Um, I wish that there was a way that we could shortcut that. Um, when we enter the AP bill, like there was a way that we could shortcut that. Um, when we enter the AP bill, like, Hey, if there's a difference between what was received and what we're entering on the bill price wise, that it just would apply that price, um, backwards. But I don't think that's something that the system can do. That's my hunch. Interesting. And a lot of it has to do with account groups. It all comes, if I remember correctly in this area, it all comes down to, it's a little bit of the tail wagging the dog because it's the GL that's really hitting mm -hmm. the projects module. And it all comes right. down to what account groups you put certain GL accounts in, whether it's, you, I don't know if you looked into the purchase price variance account, trying to put that in there, mm -hmm. but that could cause other problems. You're kind of limited in, in how much you can tweak it up front. Yeah, and we definitely do our best to keep our eye on the PPV account. Um, but I mean, just like you were saying earlier about being the data area, because there's all these things lingering that shouldn't be lingering. And then, and then I see another area, I'm like, oh, we need to work at fixing this because these things are still stuck. Um, one of the processes that we needed to put into place um, was doing material takeoffs. Um, that was a challenge that we had during implementation where we needed to figure out how we were going to get our list of materials into the system so we could um, charge it out to jobs, take it from inventory, or then put it on a purchase. If we couldn't get, take it from inventory, then we could purchase it. Um, so we've actually taken the sales orders and we've modified how sales orders are used. Um, in our purposes, we use a sales order as what we call takeoff, a material takeoff. And we have the list in there and we can see, hey, this item is an inventory item. We have 6,000 on hand. I only need 500. 
Sure, we have 6,000 on hand, I only need 500. Sure, we can pull that from inventory to send to our project, uh, to the construction field. But you know, the next item is, sure, it's an inventory item, but we only have 50 on hand and I need 1,000. I need to order, I need to tell the purchasing manager to order. So um, in that, our struggle was, and I think it's getting fixed in, in 21 R1, R2, um, is the whole situation of ordering something for a job directly to that job. Um, I think you had leaned into that some in your podcast the other week when you talked about the release. Uh, event yeah, that drop that ship. Worked. Yeah, that does look mm-hmm. interesting. So it sounds like you have two different situations. You have one thing that you're calling a takeoff, which I think is a common construction term. That's the list of stuff you know about ahead of time. It sounds like now you're talking about the stuff that trickles in that you don't necessarily want to run through a takeoff. You just want to send it right to the job cost wise in that you don't necessarily want to run through a takeoff. You just want to send it right to the job cost wise. Right. Right. Well, we have both. Um, So we have the list of stuff that we know we're going to need for a job, but then we have, you know, manufacturing that says, Hey, I just need a truckload of this size rebar. And so we have to order that right now that has to go through the sales order process so that it can hit the job. Uh, We use uh, multiple job warehouses and a shipping uh, schedule, um, a timed schedule that, you know, it, it sees if there's anything available for uh, shipping out of the warehouse, then it recognizes that it's there, it ships it. And then it, you know, the third process then updates that inventory, um, and so with that process, then we can get stuff shipped out of our job warehouse that we receive in. It's kind of complicated, but it it makes it work for us so that it can alleviate some of that extra work that we're doing. You think that new feature, that wouldn't necessarily replace your upfront takeoff stuff. This would just handle the situation mm-hmm. for the stuff that you don't want to have to run through the rigmarole of the takeoff process. You just want to take it straight to the job. Right. Right. Yep. That schedule, uh, we were talking about that before we hit record. That sounded interesting to me. It sounds like you've got a dedicated warehouse. That's a job warehouse. And so if you designate a line on a sales order line to go through the job warehouse, it essentially should just go right to the job. Uh, if you have it available, if I'm, if I'm describing it correctly, and it sounds like you had some kind of schedule I think it was three schedules running. One was to schedule one, create the shipment, schedule two, confirm the shipment, schedule three, update inventory. And doing those 15, schedule one, create the shipment, schedule two, confirm the shipment, schedule three, update inventory. And doing those 15 minutes apart from each other so they don't overlap. Am I describing that right? And is there, what, what gotchas are there with that process? Yeah, so you definitely described that way better than I did. And um, the gotcha with it is on the sales order, if you have a date on there, um, that it wants you to, to have, we like we assign a date where we want to have our materials by, and that's how we communicate that to our purchasing manager. If that, if the materials come in before that date, the materials get what I would call stuck in that job warehouse because they won't ship because it doesn't realize that there is um, a demand for it yet because the demand date hasn't hit. But what we find is after that date hits, it will randomly just ship it someday. It, there's afterwards. Yeah. <laughs> it's kind of odd. So is this the ship on, on date on the sales order line? I think so. Yeah. I I've, I've noticed that before too. It's to me, it's backwards from what I would think it should be. It's like, if I tell the customer I'm going to ship on a certain date, I want to be allowed to get it there early. I almost want it to stop yeah. me from getting there late. I want it to like freeze, but yeah. it does the opposite, right? It doesn't let you send it to the right. customer early, which is, I think is strange. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Exactly. That's exactly what it's doing. So yeah, it's just kind of um, odd the way that that works. Um, and if it gets towards the month end and we see a lot of stuff just sitting in that warehouse, we just go in and we manually, we manually issue it from the sales order. Then um, there's good, good connections in those, in the lookups that we have for uh, on our dashboard widgets um, to get to those stuck items. Uh, the other thing that we do see with that, that it's not a hindrance, but there are times where that 
Now, it's not a hindrance, but there are times where I'll take rebar, for example, we'll order a truckload, um, like a 45,000 pound truckload of rebar. And it'll come in at 40, 45,800 pounds. So when we receive it, we receive the 45,800 pounds of rebar, but that 800 pounds was not accounted for on the sales order. And the 800 the 800 pounds gets stuck in the warehouse. So it's those uh, overage materials because the sales order is only looking for 45,000. So, and that's something else we just have to, we keep our eye on so that we can just issue that as well to the same job because um, that job is the one that consumed it. And when you said, you said earlier, multiple job project or at least separate warehouse bin locations per project or how's the linking work there? Uh, we set up one project warehouse per job, and that initially we had started by just creating them manually, and I realized I wasn't keeping up with it. Um, so we actually turned that into a business event um, where we have a business event run at the time of a project creation, um, like when a job is made active, um, it automatically creates the job warehouse then, um, so it's all ready to go for when that job gets to that point of ordering materials. That sounds very cool. And then do you just number it the same number as the project number, the warehouse number? Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah, so the warehouse number equals the project number. Yep. Okay. And it kind of keeps it, it's straightforward because our construction guys and guys that work in the warehouse, they know the project number. So it's really easy. They just think project number and it connects them. Very cool. And it's just one. You're not having to do like uh, multiple. I mean, we don't need to get into the specifics of the business at company X, but it's not like you have multiple physical locations for needing different shipping paperwork. It, it's okay to get away with one warehouse per, per job for the most part. Yeah. So we have um, one base location and then our job sites, uh, I would say, are from Maine to Georgia and then as far west as Arkansas. Um, so that's kind of, Arkansas has been the furthest, but typically like Indiana, like the Mississippi, a little further than the Mississippi. Um, that's kind of our, we're on the Eastern, Eastern seaboard. So yeah, we have job sites and we ship out to those job sites from our one dedicated location where our manufacturing facility and our office is located. And where our manufacturing facility and our office is located. Interesting. I like hearing about some of these creative uses because I, I think that although Acumatica is unique in that it can handle construction and manufacturing and inventory, you know, you don't need multiple systems. Um, there's also challenges with being a horizontal solution. And I, I think you have to get creative using a sales order. What's a sales order? That's not mm -hmm. something involved in a project, the way you're using it. And you doing yeah. the business event warehouse. Uh, it sounds like you're you're willing. Here's the theme of willing to roll up your sleeves and and get creative to get stuff done. But at least you're you're still moving towards this uh, holistic system approach. And because Acum that's the the advantage of it is that Acumatic is flexible to allow you to do that. So it sounds like creative uses of the system there. Yeah, and I do think on um, our implementation team. We're yeah, and I do think on um, our implementation team with between our VAR, we have an outside consultant that we use um, because we haven't, we don't have a strong in-house IT department. Um, so we have an outside consultant for that. And then the team that we've assembled from within our company um, for our implementation. Um, I think for the most part, we are all out of the box thinkers, we're all capable of doing that. And we all have in vested interest in thinking outside of that box and saying, okay, how can we, how can we take what we have and improve upon it and, and just utilize it in a different way. Um, we've, I know I had listened to one of your podcasts. I'm not sure which it was uh, somewhat recently, but they talked about how they, um, they needed to look beyond their and we had from the beginning because we have said, look, if we're going to implement this system, we're not going to change the system to meet our ways of doing things. We're going to change our ways to meet 
the system because the system is obviously way more progressive than where we were, you know, because we had been in the same accounting system for decades and it was just not working anymore. Quick time check. It is 325. I've got another call at 345. How are you on, on mm-hmm. time? Um, could we go yeah, another 10 I got minutes it. or so? Yep. So I'm good. as promised, we're definitely going to have a part two on this. Um, what, what do you think next on your, your long uh, list of notes there? Maybe, maybe we table payroll till we can really bite into it on part two. Uh, what do you think? What, what's another yeah, maybe or we, we quicker give thing a we can talk about? Too. Okay. We yeah. Wh- wherever you want to go, yeah, uh, balls in your court. What do you want to hit next? Well, I yeah, think wh- wherever you want to go, yeah, uh, balls in your court. What do you want to hit next? Well, I would say um, touching on the manufacturing side. So for us to get to manufacturing and the quality control implementation that we did, that we've been working on, um, we needed to get the customization under control for the budget lines. Um, because if not, it was just going to create adding in manufacturing was just going to open up Pandora's box for even more wrong entries, more problems um, with the way that we have manufacturing set up because we are a full, I would call us a full custom shop. We're not making widgets. We're making custom pieces every single day um, and everything is unique. So we definitely had challenges we needed to overcome with the manufacturing. Um, But to be honest, I have not been involved in the manufacturing as much as I was on a team of two people that were, that did the payroll implementation. Um, along with our VAR. And it was quite the, uh, payroll implementation was quite the adventure. We'll put it that way. Um, Maybe the main reason why we're listing your company as company X here, right? We want to be able to be honest without uh, pointing fingers or throwing anyone under the bus. (laughs) Yeah. So as far as our payroll implementation goes, I think our company is unique. We are a non-union shop. Um, however, we get heavily involved with, um, certified projects, projects that have either federal Davis-Bacon, have state prevailing wage, uh, requirements and learning the ins and outs and payroll only being, when we went live, payroll was only one year old. Um, you know, when you talk about that payroll module, um, I think there was still a lot of learning, um, to do, um, on our behalf. Um, and like I said, I am new to the payroll, um, position. Um, I took that on as part of my acceptance of doing, uh, Acumatica admin at the beginning of this calendar year. So, um, those, those are things, some of the, the main challenges and also simply getting your data out of your old system. That was not an easy, easy feat for us as well. Interesting. Do you, do you feel like uh, with payroll, was it, um, do you feel like you knew, you knew that there were risks going in knowing it was only a year old, or do you feel like you had maybe too much of a perfect pie in the sky? This will be fine view of payroll. Like what, what pushed you to jump in? I would say earlier on, uh, was it similar to the CRM where your old system was getting shut off or was it, more that getting shut off or was it more that you just thought it would be fine and maybe a little too naive with payroll? Um, definitely not because our system was going to get shut off. We were, um, our system is still, our old system is still being supported. And ironically, we are still utilizing our old system for portions of time card entry uh, for our manufacturing department because um, therein lies one of the, the problems we have with the Acumatic payroll. There's no connection between a, a time card app that will work for us. Um, so we are still trying to be creative um, six months after going live with payroll. So we use our old system for our payroll um, time card, our time capturing, um, clock in and clock out in time uh, project uh, um, what I want to, like job. Uh, a time capture like data enter the time spent on different mm-hmm. jobs it's not actually processing yeah. the payroll with all the whatever happens with Mm-mm. complicated payroll tax calculations and all that 
Correct. We okay. we do an import with all of the time and the project information from the old system into Axmatica, and then we process that payroll. So our our company is kind of in three divisions. We have a construction, which is where we find our certified payroll reporting needs. We have our manufacturing, which the complication there is the antiquated system and not a good solution in Acumatica yet. And then we have our office and salary group, um, which they're probably the easiest ones to process their time. But it's it's the age old adage of, hey, can you get your time card done? It's Monday kind of situation. You just seem to attract uh, this type of of work, right? I, have you ever seen? Um, <laughs> I actually uh, the the show. It's a show called Dirty Jobs on the Discovery Channel. I just looked it up, make sure I had it right. A guy named Mike Rowe. Yeah. You ever heard of that? Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when I worked at that manufacturing company, I was in the same situation. They just like it just sort of stuck to me, all that kind of stuff. <laughs> so it's yeah, not a surprise to I me understand. that you get to be the one sending out the, the email reminders to uh, fill out your timesheet. <laughs> yep. Yep. And all my coworkers are like, ah, oh, there's Laura again. I guess I got to do my timesheet. <laughs> oh, goodness. But you're live on payroll, at least for the processing of payroll. You still got to find we are. interest. Sounds like specifically a manufacturing a time entry that will uh is it is, is the issue that it's something that you can actually key into acumatica production order numbers is that part of the sticking point or is it like an online offline need or issue that it's something that you can actually key into acumatica production order numbers is that part of the sticking point or is it like an online offline need or what, what's the main sticking point there um so the main sticking point is that um, in our manufacturing facility, they get paid for every minute that they're clocked in and clocked out or that they're clocked in. So if they clock in at 544 and they work till four o'clock in the afternoon and they've clocked out for a 30 minute break, I need to account for every single one of those minutes in their job costing. It doesn't just go to overhead It and their time gets broken up by by multiple different projects, you know, so they have a project that they work on for an hour and a half and they have another thing that they do on another project for three hours that day. And, and so their total number of minutes have to go into a dedicated bucket for a project at the end of the day. Um, so unfortunately we've had a really difficult time finding either I, I know that there's a couple of solutions out there, but we've not really found the best solution where we can have, you know, that freestanding time clock, if you would, or the, the device that they clock in and clock out with their unique IDs. And that we can also go in there and list out exactly what they did to the minute and take that time and, you know, divide it up, you know, and get to the same answer and then take that information and, and dump it into Acumatica that, We've just not been successful up to this point in finding that solution. And, you know, have that, that path has also gotten derailed multiple times simply because we had other emergencies we were dealing with, like the, the budget lines and figuring how, out how to go live with, with payroll and then the problems we ran into. Interesting. So back on that one, it sounds like you almost have two different data capture things. You have one that's at a, more summarized level. It's a clock in and clock out event for the day for an employee. Mm -hmm. And then the second one is the more granular level, which is actually allocating that out to the individual jobs. And it might be too tedious to have them clocking in and clocking mm -hmm. out of every single job, especially when your hands are yeah. in a man all dirty in a manufacturing environment. But it's almost like a reconciliation yeah. activity after the fact. You want to capture both Absolutely. and then you want to reconcile the two together. Absolutely. And you hit it nail on the head. Like we cannot have them go over to a kiosk, punch out of one job, punch into the next. Like that is for what we do. That is completely not something that we can, that we can accommodate even um, the working conditions that we have, the environment that we have in our manufacturing plant. It just, it's not conducive to it. So I think it's pretty know, common looked, in most manufacturing environments, right? So that's why it sounds right. like the clock in and clock out, that's what's still being captured. That data set is still being captured mm -hmm. in your, your old system. 
Yeah. So like right now we're, we're uh, capturing the clock in and clock out with a, with a physical punch in punch out clock. And then um, it, and that connects with our old software. And once then at the end of the day, the supervisors go in and they have handwritten sheets of what their guys worked on. And, you know, they just take those handwritten sheets and they plug all that data in. Um, we have something similar that happens with our construction teams because they are not digital out in the field. Um, they turn in a physical paper time card. I'm just lucky enough to have an assistant in our construction department that is willing to sit, you know, on Monday mornings for four hours and enter all, you know, their handwritten information, enter that into Acumatica time cards for me. Pausing point on this conversation. I, I definitely want to, we'll yeah. have to work out our next time. I want to get you back in, like, not on the normal weekly cadence, so we can pick this up as soon as possible, picking up with yeah, the payroll. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah. Th- thanks for coming on. I-, I love the level of detail that you're able to talk to. Um, and I think being, I- I'd like to, maybe we even have a part three, you know, wh- whatever you're willing to do. Uh, <laughs> because I think there's a lot of details with this cross industry type of need that you have that I think there's a lot of gaps in Acumatica when you cross those those uh, modules, mm-hmm. manufacturing, construction. Yeah. I know you got more to say about payroll um, and <laughs> I, I'd love to hear more and more of those details. So thanks for part one of this. And, yeah. um, are we good Absolutely. To, to, we'll work out by email when we can do a part two. That sounds like a great plan. All right, Laura from Company X. I'll let you go for now and uh, when we can do a part two. That sounds like a great plan. All right, Laura from Company X. I'll let you go for now and uh, we'll pick it up in part two. Okay, that sounds great. Have a great afternoon, Tim. All right, well, that's it for now. We'll catch you on the next episode of AUGforums.com Real Talk. Thanks for listening and take care.